Hello and welcome to the KU Community Webinar Series. I'm joined by Professor Katrina Branstead Hi. and we're here to talk about research ethics. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be here. Let's start off with ethics in general and the role of an ethics advisory committee. Right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, absolutely have to have one. Mm because people can't just go out and do what they want to do. They may have a great idea uh, about research, uh, but you need to have some oversight. And a research ethics committee is a group of people who looks at your protocol uh, for things like statistics, what's your research question, the methods, uh, make sure you have enough funding to even do your research mm -hmm. so it can be completed, but also be sure that there's enough safety mechanisms built in so people participating in your research, the volunteers, will be protected. Uh, and that's really, really important. So it's a lot more than just this is a good idea or this is a dangerous idea. Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of people have great ideas mm. and we don't want to stifle that but we want to find a way to take a good idea and then enable it in a safe way. And a responsible way. Absolutely. I'm assuming then that that means not all research gets approved. Not all research gets approved. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a variety of reasons why something could get declined. Uh, maybe that research has already been done. So maybe it's not novel. And you think it's novel, but actually uh, as it's evaluated, we find out actually really not, and it would be wasteful of resources uh, oh, okay. of all different types. So we wouldn't want to do it. Or as design, perhaps it's not safe. Mm. And so you need to revise it, modify it, optimize it to make it safer. Uh, so those are some of the things that our research ethics committee would look at as they're going through all of the documents, the packet that actually gets submitted when someone wants to do research. It was my assumption that a research uh, an ethics committee would only really be looking at the safety of the participants and the volunteers and that sort of thing. I wasn't aware you'd also be looking at whether it was a justified use of resources. Absolutely, absolutely, because that's an ethics component. Mm. Uh, resources come from people's for example, tax money, or sometimes uh, a sponsor comes in and brings their money to support research mm -hmm. or a government supports research. And money is finite. Yeah. Uh, we, we can't go off and print it somewhere. Uh, that would not be ethical either. Uh, so we want to be sure that any monies put towards research are really used in a wise way and not wasted. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, they will also look at a budget for a, a research protocol to be sure that things are allocated properly. They want to be sure that your research will, in fact, be run and carried out to the end. You don't want to be left hanging and say, well, I can't finish my project. Well, the Research Ethics Committee would look at those things in advance mm -hmm. and say, hey, your budget looks like it's going to fall a little short. Let's be sure you've, you've got enough. Maybe go back to your sponsor because these particular areas need a little bit more funding. We want to be sure you can recruit all those people that mm. you need for your study uh, or that you have enough uh, data experts to analyze the maybe the thousands and thousands of data points that you're going to get, things like that. There is always a concern with science that the thing that you're testing isn't actually going to come to fruition, that you're not going to find what you thought you'd find. Yes. Does that come up at all when you're looking at it to see whether it would be justified by an ethics committee? Is that a concern? Or if you had a previous failure, would mm -hmm. that come into question as well? Well, what they look at first is you have a research question and does your methods actually align? Okay. So could you in fact get the answer that you think you're going to get with the methods that you've mm. chosen? And if they don't line up, they'll say, hey, these methods aren't quite right. Perhaps consider this method. They do want you to succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, sometimes you do the entire research project and you follow your fantastic methods and you don't get the answer you were expecting. Yeah. All right. Uh, we sometimes call those negative results. Mm. But interestingly, those can actually be publishable. They can actually have value because they can teach you something else. So uh, it's not really uh, in my book or many ethicists, we don't consider that failure at all. Mm -hmm. The fact that you followed the protocol, uh, you didn't do any research misconduct, you stuck to what was approved, that is um, highly laudable. And even negative results can have value. Let's talk about areas that might be considered ethically controversial. Okay. What kind of examples might you have for that? Oh, there's lots. Uh, and this is, again, another reason why we have research ethics mm. committees, because if you're going to do anything ethically sensitive, they want to help you do it in a way that uh, maybe the community could understand it a little better. 
Um, and also when you publish it, um, you'll have a better chance of publishing it. So, but sensitive areas could be anything like military or defense research, mm -hmm. research with uh, reproductive organs, um, so sperm and egg, uh, research with people who are maybe very ill, terminally ill, okay. and they have no options, uh, research with refugees or migrants, uh, people who perhaps don't have any health insurance mm. or are underinsured or, or poor. Uh, th those would be some categories that, that would be make, that would make your research more complicated, let's put it that way, and have a higher level of scrutiny by any research ethics committee. What would you need to have in place to protect those people or to get a ethics approval mm -hmm. for that kind of work? Because work in those areas is still valuable and important yep. and we can't just not do it because exactly. there might be people at risk. Exactly. So sometimes we have what's called a data safety monitoring board. That's an external group that will get appointed. No members of that group are part of the research team, mm -hmm. so they're separate they're, and they're often around the world maybe five, seven people. It will include an external statistician. And they're sort of an independent neutral party that will keep an eye on your study. And if anything looks perhaps unsafe, people may be getting harmed or whatever, they can press the stop button, mm. pause your study and say, wait a minute now, we need to take a look at things. And they do that uh, externally, uh, objectively, because they're not connected to the study. They're not the principal investigator or on mm -hmm. the team. Uh, another role is a research subject advocate. That's a person like an ethicist who can be appointed to a study to also keep an eye on the study for safety, talk to all the research participants, how's it going, are you having any troubles, do you have any issues you'd like to discuss with me. They also can even help in the onboarding or the consent process mm -hmm. for enrolling participants in research that's highly sensitive. I yeah. suppose part of the reason that things like this crop up is because we forget that research projects take a long time. They do. It's not a matter of I've got an idea I'm going to test it immediately. It's right. all the recruitment, all of the different issues, you've got to do updates. Yeah, lots so of steps. So at any point. Lots of steps. Yeah. Lots of steps. And sometimes studies will lag a little bit. You may have trouble recruiting people to mm -hmm. participate or uh, you may have uh, you know, volumes and volumes of data to analyze. So even when it's over and you've got your data, that you got to look at it. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes it can take years from end to end. Then when you write it up, you've got to try to get it published. That's another uh, drama right there. The other thing I'm hearing from this is that areas of research that you wouldn't think would need ethics approval, it mm. sounds like everything does. I mean, if I'm going into engineering and I'm not going anywhere near other people mm -hmm. to do my research, I still need ethics approval to make sure that the money is being spent in the right place. Yeah, now it's going to depend upon your region of practice. Mm -hmm. If you need to go to a human research ethics committee or just an internal ethics committee, okay. even if you don't have a, a human participant, but certainly uh, oversight and people looking at your project is, is really uh, important, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and believe it or not, even certain surveys, like a questionnaire yeah. that you might put out on the internet or something like that, a lot of those actually do need to go through a human research ethics committee because you actually have human involvement. A lot of those do. So even if it's anonymous, even if it's people... Well, that then, then we get into another area. Okay. Is my survey anonymous or anonymized? And those are two very different things. And a lot of people don't understand that. Anonymous means you've never, ever collected any personal data, even an IP address, mm. for somebody participating in your study. Anonymized means you have collected that data, but then later you sifted it out. You sorted it out. You pulled it away and you saved it somewhere for later use, so you can still get to it. That's anonymized. Okay. I'm a master's student. I'm doing my first piece of research. I'm a PhD candidate. I'm trying to do my first big piece of research. Okay. What are the areas that I need to consider before I can submit my proposals to an ethics committee? Are there any kind of blanket advice tips yep. you'd give to someone? Uh, firstly, do a really robust literature search to be sure that nobody's already done your topic. Mm. You, you, you'd be surprised. Um, and even if somebody out there has done something maybe very close, see what you could do different. How could you use that as a launch point? So don't get depressed right away like it's all over. You may be able to launch from that and find a little niche area where then your work would in fact be novel. So robust literature search, that, that is something that I would say 70% of researchers miss. Because mm -hmm. I used to be an IRB chair, so I can tell you this for, for true. 
Um, and when you do submit your, your project, write it very well. Mm -hmm. Take really good care for grammar, spelling, uh, punctuation. Be detail-oriented because those things, if you're not detail-oriented, it shows to the committee that you don't care. Okay. You're not paying attention. So if you don't pay attention there, maybe you don't pay attention in your research and in your data collection. So it makes people a little bit concerned. So don't jump ahead to the what you think is the interesting bit. Take the time yeah, to start to set right. everything up right. Yep. Brilliant. Professor Katrina, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.